our typical image of Mother Nature. Peter Ward is an award-winning paleontologist and professor of biology at the University of Washington. The full title of his new book is The Medea Hypothesis, Is Life on Earth Ultimately Self-Destructive? Peter, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Now, I gave a brief overview of your theory, but tell us more. What is the Medea Hypothesis? Well, Medea was, as you mentioned, a, a very pitiless mother and I was trying to put up, I guess, an alternative to the long-running Gaia hypothesis. Gaia, named for the good mother, the Greek good mother of Earth, is an idea or a theory or a hypothesis, depending upon who you talk to, that life really makes the planet better for life, that the longer life is on this planet, uh, the better the recirculatory systems of elements, the temperature, the pH of the oceans, all of these get better and better and better, suitable for ever more life. And left to its own devices, we just get this more and more optimal world. And then a lot of us who study deep time and also the far future, so we've tried to merge the deep time geological record with what the astronomers can tell us, really see a different picture. It's like nature is, is it certainly has no direction, and it's a rather blunt, stupid instrument blundering from place to place. Even naming it Medea probably gives uh, nature more credit than it's worth. But we do see this reversion to older times on occasion, and these are called mass extinctions. Now, we've all seen Bruce Willis try to save the Earth and Deep Impact and Armageddon, but most of the mass extinctions weren't caused by asteroids from space, as the movies would show us, but rather microbial takeovers, times when oxygen has dropped, really nasty poison-emitting bacteria begin to cover over the oceans, and the subsequent emission of very poisonous hydrogen sulfide gas five times in Earth history has almost ended life on this planet. So we don't see any direction at all, and in fact, uh, the only out on this planet or any planet, because we think the same sort of manifestations will happen anywhere, is intelligence, intelligence and engineering. Now, I want to break this down a little bit, because the Gaia hypothesis that you referred to is the kind of thing that it has really sort of uh, given the modern environmental movement its basis, the idea that... Uh, that there are systems in place, nature puts systems in place that sustains life, and then man comes along and disturbs those systems. Tell us why people believe in this hypothesis. What kind of systems are they referring to? Well, the systems they do talk about mainly are the carbon cycle. As we know, carbon, which is the majority of the scaffolding of every one of our cells, is necessary to us all. And there's carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Plants take that uh, turn it into oxygen as well as plant material. So without this plant cycle, cycling carbon in and out of the atmosphere, there's really no place, there's no ability to have animals on our planet, nor is there oxygen, which we animals all need. But on the other hand, if you look at the long-term history of carbon in the atmosphere, it's pretty interesting. It's been dropping in almost a straight line for the last 500 million years, and we can project forward and see when it hits zero. And it hits zero in about the same amount of time that we have had animals on this planet. And the reason carbon is dropping is that animal life and plant life has been bundling up into rocks. Those rocks get out of the cycle, they get stashed away in continents, and the end of life as we know it is foreordained by life removing this carbon from the cycle. It's not inorganic, it's nothing to do with anything but life. I see. And so that, that is where you, you see that life turns on itself and basically brings about its own end. Yeah, there's nothing conscious about it. It's mm -hmm. just that evolution has increasingly uh, optimized the ability of certain types of life to make calcium carbonate skeletons. This requires CO2, and it's been sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere, and it will be the self-limiting end of life on this planet. Now, Peter uh, Peter Ward, uh, author of The Medea Hypothesis, you told us, you kind of told us real quickly about some of the mass extinctions that have occurred on Earth. There have been five mass extinctions. Is that correct? Well, there have been five big ones when over half the species go extinct, and we paleontologists refer to those as the big five, but there's ten others that were also very catastrophic, although not getting up to, say, the 50 percent. Of all these mass extinctions, only one can be pinned on an asteroid impact, and that's, of course, the famous dinosaur-killing event. We found the crater. It is in the Chicxulub region of Yucatan Peninsula. And for a while, from, say, the year 1990 to even two years ago, we thought that every one of those mass extinctions was caused by impact. 
But we have really sophisticated new ways of looking at rocks, and we can extract molecules called biomarkers. These are the remains of cell walls of various types of bacteria, and it's a, really a case of microbes run wild in each of these mass extinction episodes, and it's brought about first by short-term global warming, second by uh, an anoxic loss of oxygen out of very stagnant cesspool oceans, and thirdly, those conditions allow these poison brewing bacteria to step up and poison everything, and they've done it 14 times. Tell us a little bit about that cycle that is sort of like the reverse of life cycle that happens in the oceans when there's this overproduction of microbes and that robs the oceans of oxygen. Yeah, the primary catalyst to all of this is, is extraordinary volcanism. For short periods of time, say even a half million years, the Earth spews out enormous, gigantic provinces of lava. It's not like one volcano like Mount St. Helens. These are areas, the biggest, for instance, covers a huge area of Siberia, almost the size of the continental U.S. Well, it's not the lava that kills things. It's the CO2, the carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas that goes in the atmosphere. The planet warms to the point that if the poles are almost as warm as the equator, there's nothing to drive ocean or air currents. When that happens, the oceans go stagnant. When they go stagnant, they lose their oxygen. When they lose their oxygen, the poison brewing bacteria take over. So it, the volcanism or global warming starts the process, but it's life that causes the killing. I see. So, well, this kind of leads to uh, the question, are we in the midst of another mass extinction by your calculations? Absolutely. We are producing CO2 at a rate even faster than any of these past volcanic episodes. For instance, we know that there can never be uh, sheet ice above about 1,200 parts per million carbon dioxide. We're at 385 and climbing. And it may be that even at 1,000 parts per million, which is someplace we will probably be uh, certainly by 2200, but perhaps by 2150. So in a little over 100 years, we may be at the same carbon dioxide level that created the conditions leading to these mass extinctions. So it's not anything that's going to happen five years after that. Th these are probably on millennial timescales. But then again, any species of mammal usually lasts 7 million years. We've been around a half million. Why can't we be a 7 million year animal? And if that's the case, we do have to worry about the next 1,000 years, 2,000, 5,000 years, and this is staring us right in the face. Right, so it's interesting. Your theory doesn't necessarily counter that of, uh, let's say, let's call them traditional environmentalists who say that, you know, the Earth is in a bad place right now, but your, your tactics are different. It's not that uh, people should stand back and let nature take its course. It's people have to do something. Absolutely. The only way out is engineering. And by engineering, I don't necessarily mean bricks and mortar and great big metal scaffoldings. The engineering that we're going to be doing and are doing is going to be at the life level. People like Craig Venter are working furiously on trying to produce fuel out of microbes and food out of microbes. Uh, I was with Freeman Dyson this last weekend, and his sense of things, the same thing, is that bioengineering is, is the engineering of the future. But there's a nastier possibility, and Paul Crutzen, the Nobel Prize-winning atmospheric chemist, has said that if we don't get our act together, we will have to seed or salt the atmosphere with sulfate minerals. This is what a volcano does. This will certainly reduce warming on the planet, but at the same time, it will cut down crops and it will further acidify the ocean. This is a draconian solution that we should never have to get into. Right now, Tyler is on the line from San Marcos. Good morning, Tyler. How are you doing? Great. I just wanted to say I found this pretty interesting that, that you're essentially saying, you know, the cycle of life on Earth is, is self-destructing in a way, but renewing in a sense as well. Um, and I find it interesting because we've, we've heard a lot over the last few years that uh, black holes essentially that are forming are, are slowly sucking in planets and giving birth to uh, new galaxies and essentially that whole circle of life starting over again, but on a much larger scale. So good stuff. Well, thanks so much. And actually, you did publish a book uh, back in 2000 called A Rare Earth, Why Complex Life is Uncommon in the Universe. So are you basically trying to find universal principles in the way that the Earth, uh, the earth has mass extinctions and then comes, the life comes back? Absolutely. I'm a part of the University of Washington Astrobiology Group, and it's a larger part of NASA. We're part of the NASA Astrobiology Institute. And what we're trying to do is just understand principles from Earth that apply to other planets. You know, we're finding these fabulous Earth-like planets everywhere now that we are starting to look. And the Kepler mission is now flying. We can expect to really understand that we are not alone as an Earth-like planet. On the other hand, 
any planet has a series of catastrophes it probably goes through. Um, I, 